Herzlich willkommen. A warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, friends, in and of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. We're extremely happy that so many of you are here. And at the same time, we want to apologize to all those who have not found an empty seat here in the large auditorium. We have 150 more people who wanted to participate, and they wait outside. We have a transmission of this event to a smaller room, and you can also follow it on the large stairs. All contributions, all presentations tonight will be translated into German, English, and Russian. And already now, I'd like to thank the interpreters for their demanding job. And in case you need translation, and if you don't have a headset yet, please make sure that you get one right away. For a few years now, we, the Heinrich Böll Foundation, have organized an annual conference on European policy with the title EU Pluvadis. Last autumn, we decided that this time we should focus not on the internal problems of the EU, but rather we said we should focus on a conflict in our eastern neighborhood that will definitely shape the future and the shape of our continent. At stake is nothing less than the future security architecture of Europe and the internal development of the European Union itself. These days, it's impossible to think about Russia, to talk about the Ukraine without remembering Boris Nemtsov. His violent death is significant for the tragic development that Russia experienced in the past few years. Those who are interested in the democratic opposition in Russia could not ignore Nemtsov. I myself, I also met him several times at conferences or during protest rallies in Moscow where he participated untiringly. And even though he was uh, 50 plus, he seemed boyish, full of energy, fearless in his almost hopeless struggle against the Putin system. He knew exactly about the risks when he countered the chauvinistic delirium of the Ukraine war. And now that he is dead, all regret this loss, even the Russian president. However, who wanted to listen to Nemtsov when he was still alive and when he said that Russia was turned into a mafia state and where parliament, the judiciary and the TV stations were turned into instruments of power? To quote the Russian author Lou Rubinstein, I don't know who killed Boris and who commanded to do this, but we know who creates this atmosphere in society where these killings are not just possible, but even inevitable." End of quote. During the weekend before the killing, Nemtsov was caused to be a traitor of the motherland when he participated in these missions. It is the political engineers of Putin that created this climate of hatred regarding all the defectors and the Westerners, and the public prosecution is already preparing the next skim, uh, speaking of the Ukrainian track that they will now follow during the investigations. On the eve of the killing, I met with Irina Sherbakova, historian and long-term staff with Memorial, long-term friend of our foundation. And we had a conversation that was marked by bitterness and the desperate hope that it's not all lost. 
she spoke of the propaganda of hatred in the mass media, of psychological war preparations that eats itself into the minds of people like poison. She talked about the exclusion of every internal opposition as the so-called fifth column of the enemy. The power show of the Kreml to the outside corresponds to an increasing aggressiveness to the inside. And in fact, we can only understand today's political approach of Russia when you think of it together. For the part of the Russian intelligentsia that still belongs to the dissidents of the Soviet era, the return of Russia into this aggressive fortress mentality amounts to a dual tragedy not only because of the repression and the turning away of the country from the European path. No, for the intellectuals of the oppositions at the time, there were no borders, no national borders within the Soviet Union. The world of the dissidents covered from Moscow to Leningrad to Riga to Minsk, Kiev and Tiflis. And to now experience this newly reignited chauvinism that drives a deep wedge between Russia and the former Soviet countries is for the democratic intelligentsia a political and a personal tragedy. The funeral march yesterday for Boris Nemtsov was accompanied by numerous Russian flags. And this is legitimate. It is the real patriots that want to give back to Russia its dignity. As our friends in Russia resist to be defamed as foreign agents, we refuse being accused that the criticism of Putin's policy was anti-Russian. It is not. However, it's true. There is nothing that the ruling in Kreml fear more than a spillover of Maidan to Moscow. The war of attrition against the Ukraine is used as a warning to show that every democratic rebellion will inevitably lead to violence, chaos, and collapse. The thought of freedom and self-determination is to be discredited. This is the aim. On Maidan, three fundamental motives came together. The elementary desire for more justice and freedom, the protest against the ransacking caused by a corrupt system of potents and oligarchs, and the striving for national independence and emancipation free from the supremacy of Russia. All three motives came together in a call for more Europe. And ever more disturbing is the reluctance that we were able to see in a large part of the European public when it came to showing a response from the very right to the very left, the emancipation movement of the Ukraine was simply ignored. And today, we saw once again an example in this respect. However, there is a lot of understanding for the revanchism of Russian autocracy. Very difficult to understand why a part of the left supports a system that focuses on large-scale power, that wants to overcome every division of power, that discriminates homosexuals, and that wants to hold all the assets in the hands of a few. What is left or leftist or progressive about this? Prague 1968, or the attitude regarding solidarność, solidarity. Maidan became a dividing line between a liberal and an authoritarian leftist. And to say it with the words of the German-Russian author Boris Rumotsky, a uh, left that doesn't know what to do with the revolution and even pushes for a new counter-enlightenment is no longer leftist. Today, we have a fragile ceasefire in Ukraine. A political solution of the conflict is not within reach. 
And as long as there is no agreement on the withdrawal of Russian troops and weapons, on the control of the Ukrainian-Russian border, on the participation of international forces, as well as on the status of the separatist areas, the ceasefire, at best, will turn to a frozen conflict. Worse, it is maybe just a break that allows us to take a breath. Putin has not yet achieved his goals. Negotiations is for him only to secure gained territory. The Russian leadership combines military, propaganda, and economic pressure. On the other hand, the European Governments, as well as the United States, are far away from a consistent strategy. So far, they simply react. They do not act. It is unclear what the sanctions should achieve. It's unclear what the strategic goals are for the West when it comes to Ukraine. Are we still committed to the political sovereignty and the territorial integrity of the country? Or are our governments, at the end of the day, willing to find a consensus with Putin at the cost of Ukraine? Will we see a Ukraine, a country that we support on its way towards Europe's? Or do we accept that it will simply belong to Russia? All talk about the neutralization of Ukraine is simply a hidden recognition of the supremacy of Moscow in Kiev. Putin expects that at one point Ukraine will no longer have stamina. And indeed, the country is already on the brink of a national bankruptcy. There is a new internal crisis, thin for the liberal democratic forces in Ukraine is, air is thin. The air is thin because these people are squeezed between the old power structures and a weak economy. And yes, there is need for Ukraine to carry out reforms. But to expect that now, in this desperate struggle to survive, they would rush to carry out reforms and turn away from authoritarianism to embrace democracy and a market economy would be unprecedented. To do this, Ukraine needs political and economic support. And ever more important is that the European Union is still committed to the association agreement with Ukraine, which is a basic pillar for the democratic reforms. If we take away the perspective this country might have, we also leave by themselves the Ukrainian reform forces. And whatever we think when it comes to these matters, we have to know that the conflict in Ukraine is not just about the hope of millions of people. It's about more than this. It's not just about their approachment towards the democratic and social achievements of Europe. No, what is at stake is actually the future of the European peace order, the future of the European community itself. Ukraine is a test. It challenges Europe's ability to take action, it challenges our credibility. If we fail to master this challenge, the centrifugal tendencies within the European Union will accelerate ever more. We know of the dangerous movements we also have within Europe. It is also about us when we talk about Ukraine and Russia. And this is one message that we want to send out here from this conference. I'd like to thank all those who came from near and far to discuss these matters. Above all, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Also, I'd like to greet our guests from Ukraine and Russia. I hope that you can take a lot of encouragement back home with you after these two days of the conference. I'm also very happy that as part of this conference, we have the exhibition Wavering Borders with works of young Ukrainian artists. Their works, pictures, paintings, installations, express the experience, hopes, and doubts of people 
in the time of political and societal transition that Ukraine currently undergoes. And uh, on behalf of all of them, I'd like to thank the curator, Katarina Ray. Last but not least, I want to thank all the colleagues from the Heinrich Böll Stiftung who organized this project. Above all, our Europe spokesperson, Christine Pütz and her team, Walter Kaufmann and his team, Sergei Lagodinsky, our conference office and the PR department. I hope that all the effort is worth it. And I hope that we all have an inspiring and productive discussion. Ich habe jetzt die große Freude. It is now my great pleasure that I can introduce our first speaker, our keynote speaker. I guess you all know him, at least by you know his name. Uh, probably also because of his works, because you read some of his books. Timothy Snyder, professor of history at the Yale University in New Haven and fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences, Vienna. A European and an American in one. He speaks five languages and reads 10 European languages. And the book that made him popular, Blood Lens, released in 2010, won 12 awards. Blood Lens, Europe between Hitler and Stalin, was translated into numerous languages. For this, he got the Hannah Arendt Prize in Political Thought and the Award for European Understanding. Timothy Snyder will now give a short introductory presentation before we have the first panel discussion. Timothy, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I, it's, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here. It's a pleasure to be invited by this particular foundation. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to watch m members of the Green Party travel to Ukraine and to Russia. And it's been impressive to learn from those, those people who have chosen to travel. Going to Kiev, I think, has made all the difference for, for a number of Germans. What I'd like to do in the next 15 or 20 minutes is try to think precisely in these moments when institutions are under stress, national institutions are under stress, European institutions are under stress, Russian, Ukrainian institutions are under stress. It's hard to think. And what I'd like to, the claim I'd like to make is that this is the essence of the problem, that the Russian threat to Europe, the threat to Europe of which the war in Ukraine is simply one sign, one aspect, is largely about thinking, largely about undermining the ability or the will of Europeans to remember how it is that they got where they are. What do I mean by this? I mean something very specific. Let me take as my beginning point the title. The title of this session in English was A World Apart. Now, as some of you may know, a World Apart was also the title of the memoir of Gustav Herling Grudzinski. His memoir, A World Apart, was one of the earliest and one of the most enlightening accounts of life in the Gulag. And among many other interesting things, Herling Grudzinski gave the following definition of what we sometimes call totalitarianism. Speaking of when a prisoner would break, Herling Grudzinski wrote, when his personality has been thoroughly dismantled into its constituent parts. So when an integral whole person, when a mind has been broken into parts is when, is when something has broken. Now, being a historian, I, I, I always 
contextualize historically these, these, these literary passages that I read. And so I want you to think with me for a moment about the historical moment when, when Herling Gurudzinski was in the Gulag. He was in the Gulag because he tried to leave Poland after the Soviet invasion of Poland in 1939. He was arrested by, um, by, by Soviet police and interrogated, and he was charged with illegally crossing the border in order to fight against the Soviet Union. Now, Herling Gurudzinski said, could you please change the charge so it will be more accurate? Please say I was leaving Poland to fight against Nazi Germany, which happened to be the truth. And his interrogator smiled and said, it doesn't make any difference. Now, why didn't it make any difference? Because this was the time of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. At this time, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were, in effect, allies. So what I want to begin the historical part of my remarks by doing is asking what it means that we now live today in a Europe where the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact the agreement between Stalin and Hitler has been rehabilitated. Not by Germans, of course, at least not by many and not yet, but by the president of the Russian Federation. Now, this may have passed you by um, that in November, President Putin rehabilitated the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. For me, um, as a historian at least, this was a very significant moment, and it's one which leads us, I think, into an understanding of how Europe is or could be falling apart. Now, it's, it's, there's some reasons why it's quite obvious that rehabilitating the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is, is, is a bad thing. Um, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was about the invasion of a good deal of Eastern Europe from the Soviet side and from the German side. Uh, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was part of a larger moment between 1938 and 1941 when the entire European system was destroyed. It was probably the key moment in that, the turning point in that. A less obvious but also interesting thing to note is that Putin rehabilitated the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact at exactly the same time that the Russian Federation is pursuing a strategy of contacts with the extreme right in Europe, right? And in fact, it's the same strategy. The reason why Stalin made an alliance with Hitler was to turn European energies against themselves. The reason why Putin makes an alliance with the European far right is to destroy the European Union. It's the exact same line of thinking. Uh, but what I would like to suggest is that there's something even deeper going on here, something even more worrisome. Because, of course, to rehabilitate the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is to rehabilitate the Second World War. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was the way the Second World War began. Hitler was looking for an ally, and he found one who allowed him to begin the Second World War. There might have been another Second World War, but the one which began with the Soviet-German alliance is, as it were, the only one that we have. So when we think of all of the crimes of the Second World War, when we think of what followed during the Second World War, we have to begin with the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Now, it's easiest to begin with the Soviet crimes, which followed 1939, when the Soviet Union invaded eastern Poland, invaded the Baltic states, committed the massacres at Katyn, deported half a million Polish citizens and, and other people. But there's also a deeper abyss here. There's a deeper abyss here, because if you begin the war in 1939, you, you notice something else. You notice something very interesting. When we look at the war through our own prism, when we look at the war through our own Western prism of memory, um, the memory of the Holocaust, we notice something very interesting and, in a way, very threatening, something which, especially in the context of the murder of, of Boris Nemtsov, I, I find very, very frightening. And that is the uninvestigated way in which the Holocaust proceeded in the Soviet Union. When we think of the Holocaust here in the West, we think of camps, we think of, we think of trains. But of course, the way the Holocaust began was as a shooting campaign in Eastern Europe, which was carried out by Germans, tens of thousands of Germans, the Einsatzgruppen, the Ordnungspolizei, many from the Wehrmacht, and so on, and by a couple of hundred thousand local people of many ethnicities, the one thing that almost all of them had in common was a Soviet passport. 
They had either joined the Soviet Union in 1939 or 1940, when the Soviet Union expanded westwards, or they were citizens of the pre-war Soviet Union. Either way, the Holocaust as it began, and the Holocaust in which half of the Jewish victims died, was carried out on the territories which had been the Soviet Union, with the massive collaboration of Soviet citizens. I say Soviet citizens because all attempts to classify them by ethnicity have to fail. Attempts to classify them by ethnicity is usually someone's nationalism fighting against someone else's nationalism. Now, the Holocaust took place all the way east as far as German troops went. It took place in Smolensk, uh, it took place in Kaluga. As far east as German troops went, Russians and others took part in the Holocaust. I stress this not to, not to single out Russians who behaved exactly as everyone else did in this situation. I say this to stress that there is a great uninvestigated chapter of history here, a great unconfronted chapter of history here. And the question that I'm trying to ask now, or the question I'm moving forward towards is, what does it mean to rehabilitate 1939? What does it mean to rehabilitate an alliance with Adolf Hitler when there is no prior confrontation with Nazi war crimes on your own territory? Or simultaneously, what does it mean to rehabilitate the history of the Soviet Union when part of the history of the Soviet Union is precisely the history of contact with Nazi Germany. Now, of course, there is a str traditional strategy here. All of this history that I've discussed, all of these crimes that took place in the occupied Soviet Union, they're not unknown. Of course, Soviet authorities knew about them. In fact, we know about them from Soviet sources and from the recollections of, of Soviet citizens, Jews and others. But there's a particular way which these crimes or the memory of these crimes or the political energy arising from these crimes has been used, has been channeled historically. In the Soviet Union, what happened is that the memory of these crimes, the blame for these crimes, was channeled towards ethnicities who were disliked for other reasons. Therefore, Soviet propaganda tried very hard to associate the Holocaust with Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, and West Ukrainians which in a way was perfectly justified. There were plenty of Holocaust perpetrators in those countries. But there were also just as many Holocaust perpetrators in other places, including Russia, which escaped blame almost entirely. The other traditional strategy, and I realize some of you will remember this, was to export blame for all these crimes to the West, to the capitalist system, to fascism, right, as a general category. So the bad things which happened in the Soviet Union in the Second War were exported to the West, either to these small nationalities or to the West, the capitalist West, as such. And then, of course, the myth of the Great Fatherland War is that all of this evil is undone. Now, you'll, you'll understand why I'm stressing this, because this export of history, or this export of responsibility for history, and I think responsibility is the crucial word. The export of responsibility for history is happening again in a very similar way. Um, just as then, so now, um, blame for the Soviet past or blame for the Nazi past in the Soviet Union is exported, is externalized. Now all of the Ukrainians are somehow fascists, right? Um, even though Ukraine suffered proportionally much more than Russia in the Second World War, now the Ukrainians as such are presented as, as, fas as, as fascists. The blame is ethnicized again. The idea of fascism and the West as backers of fascism has been resuscitated, right? That is also very familiar, that there's this fascist junta somehow and the West is behind it. That's Soviet reasoning. That's familiar. But what, what I'm trying to ask and what's new is what it means to resuscitate these Soviet-style myths, this Soviet way of exporting responsibility at the same time that you rehabilitate cooperation with Nazi Germany. This is where things start to get truly dark and, and truly strange. Um, I mean, the, the, or to put it in a, in a sharper way, what does it mean to be a pro-fascist anti-fascist, right? Or what does it mean to be an anti-fascist pro-fascist? What does it mean to embrace both of these legacies at the same time? In Russia, I think what it means, unfortunately, is the shift of the myth of the war from a defensive war to an offensive war. 
And I could be wrong, I don't think so, but in May, we're going to see the commemoration of the Great Fatherland War as a, a defensive war, of course, as a justification for the offensive war in Ukraine. There's a slippage of Russian memory going on in which a defensive war is becoming an offensive war. But in the West, and this is where I want to conclude, um, and of course, this is the most important point, in the West, what's being exported is a giant, giant contradiction a giant contradiction in which we're supposed to watch as Russia moves way to the right and yet at the same time accept that Russia claims that everyone else is way to the right. Okay, and these are the second and final parts of my remarks. My second text um, is one that many of you will know. It's, it's the poem by Yeats, uh, The Second Coming from, from 1919. The most famous passage, again, probably some of you can recite it with me, Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. What I want to claim here in my concluding remarks, the concluding part of my remarks, is that this contradiction between pro-fascism and anti-fascism, this apparent tension, is part of a larger policy which has been loosed upon you and from which you are suffering, and in which, I think, you are, you are suffering. It's part of a larger policy of making things fall apart. There isn't much of a Russian proposal for a better Europe. There is, however, a Russian strategy for making the Europe that exists fall apart. And many of you have encountered its, its symptoms in a number of ways. Supporting client states inside the European Union, supporting separatism, separatism from the European Union, or separatism within European states, supporting right-wing populism inside the European Union member states, at the extreme supporting fascism, um, fascists and neo-Nazis inside the European Union, and perhaps most deeply, providing a political theory about how things should fall apart. Because of course, the way, and you'll correct me if you want, but the way that the European Union works, the fundamental political logic of the European Union is that there's a positive relationship between civil society, sovereignty, and integration. Civil society helps sovereignty, integration helps sovereignty. Where a sovereign state is weak, civil society can help, European integration can also help. The Russian proposition is to take away integration and to take away civil society and leave sovereignty all by itself. That's a different political theory. It has, it has a certain logic and it's very, it can be very effective, but it's a different political theory. It's not a version of the one that all Europeans have grown up with and its consequences are taking things apart. The European Union at the top, states in the middle, if it's not the Russian state, um, and civil society at the bottom. Now, what's the, what's the relationship between this and this business of rehabilitating the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact? The, 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 the relationship is that pro-fascist anti-fascism, or supporting the right while, while, while being the right, which is a very odd thing, um, supporting the right while claiming not to be the right, I mean, supporting the right while claiming to be the left, is, 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 is an example of something which is going on at the level of propaganda. And these are really, this is really the last thing I want to say. Let me repeat Yeats. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Let me repeat Herling Grudzinski, a personality which is divided into its component parts. At a fundamental way, I think this is what propaganda is all about. And by Russian propaganda, I mean the things which have worked their way directly or indirectly into the way that we talk about Ukraine and therefore about Europe and therefore about ourselves. There are very standard forms of propaganda, making things up, um, there's the form of propaganda which I think of as cacophony. That is, if, if Nemtsov is murdered, then you, you claim it was the Ukrainians, you claim it was the Chechens, you claim it was the Islamic fundamentalists, you claim it was the opposition itself, you claim it was the American secret services. And by the time you've made all of these claims, it becomes harder to talk about what actually happened. There's political marketing, another very important kind of propaganda where for example, you tell some people that Ukrainians are all anti-Semitic, and then you tell other people that Ukraine is part of the international Jewish conspiracy, depending upon your market. And what I'm trying to say is that the contradiction of this is part of the point. 
the propaganda which has been loosed upon you and with which the German press and German intellectuals have so earnestly engaged in the last year is meant to be contradictory. It's meant to make it impossible to think. If I say, as Russian propaganda has said, that there is no Ukrainian state, but, that it, but the Ukrainian state is oppressive, there's no Ukrainian nation, but all Ukrainians are nationalists, there's no Ukrainian language, but Russians are being forced to speak it, right? And if I'm a pro-fascist, anti-fascist, I am filling your minds with things that contradict. And the worrying thing is how little we have noticed this. And what, what I'm trying to claim is that there is a syndrome here in which this thing that we might dismiss as propaganda has actually engaged our minds, all of our minds, our minds in, in the West. And that in this sense, and it's a very important sense, um, uh, the Kremlin is certainly winning. So this is, this is the thought with which I want to leave you. It's, it's a year after the Maidan. There are many critical things one can say about what's happened in Ukraine since the Maidan. Um, there are many ways in which Russia has won the war in Ukraine. But here's a surprising point of comparison. In the last year, and I believe I'm speaking now from the Kremlin's point of view, in the last year, things in Ukraine have gone much worse than expected. Kharkiv is still in Ukraine. Odessa, still in Ukraine. Um, even a good deal of Luhansk and Donetsk oblasts were still in, are still in Ukraine. There is no way the Russian offensive was about getting bits of Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts in the Crimea. It was much, much more ambitious than that. Things have gone for the Russians worse in Ukraine than they've expected. But the propaganda tactics that were applied to you, that were applied to Europe, these have worked much better than expected. And as a result, what were the tactics have become the strategy. What were the tactics have become the strategy. At the beginning, what was about Ukraine with a European propaganda campaign is now about Europe. With, with Ukraine just being a small aspect. So you, Europe has proven to be a softer target than Ukraine. I wish I could leave you with more hopeful words than that. But my goal is to think, and that's where these thoughts bring me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite our first panel, the participants of our first panel, please take the floor. <coughs> Bernard Kushner. Mikhailo Minakov and Lilia Shevtsova. Und ich möchte nicht versorgen. Of course, I also want to introduce the panel members to you. I mean, of course, I already introduced Timothy Snyder to you. And now I'd like to start with Lilia Shevskova to my right. And not for the first time, she is at the Böll Foundation. Lilia Shevskova is a fellow with a center on the United States and Europe. with a part of the foreign policy program at the Brookings Institution and maybe the most important American foreign policy think tank. She has researched and published extensively on transformation processes at the end of communism, Russia's domestic and foreign policy, the relations between Russia and the West, and the developments in Ukraine. Lilia has featured numerous publications and I guess 
most uh, were published by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And up until recently, she worked in the Moscow office. And I think I can say, and rightly so, that Lilia Shevsko is really one of the sharp, most sharply minded analysts of politics. Next, we have our guest from Kiev, Mikhail Minakov. He is associate professor at the Kiev Institute of Philosophy at the University Kiev Mohala Academy. Also, he is chief editor of Ideology and Politics Journal. Furthermore, he leads the Kiev-based Instituta Kritika and the Foundation for Good Politics which proved to be a scientific institution on political consulting. So Mikhailo Minakov moves between politics and science. And we have invited him because he is one of the representatives of this young and very impressive young generation of intellectuals. And uh, we think that these voices are not heard often enough. Welcome to you. And last but not least, we have Bernard Kushner. He is a French politician and physician, is what you can read very often about him. And indeed, he is a co-founder of Médecins Sans Frontières and uh, became very famous uh, as part of this organization with these international humanitarian activities of MSF. Between 1999 up until 2001, to now talk about his political career, he was appointed UN Special Representative by the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, uh, was sent to Kosovo. And I think this was also to thank him for the political and public work that he carried out in the era before. I mean, we know him since then. There weren't that many who at the beginning of the 90s stood up for a humanitarian intervention into Bosnia. From 2007 until 2010, he was French Minister of Foreign and European Affairs in the center-right Filon government. He is a well-known pro-European. He supported intensively the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty. And recently, he also co-signed the George Soros call for a strengthening of the European prerogatives as an answer to the Eurozone crisis. Bernard, in fact, I'd like to start with you. Coming back to the thesis of Timothy Snyder that were a bit gruesome, in fact, uh, when he was drawing this historical parallel to the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, which was indeed a decisive starting point, a milestone on the path down to the Second World War. And I believe that the European, and especially the German discussion about Ukraine and Russia cannot be understood if we don't have this historic fear. And therefore, I would like to ask you, Mr. Kushner, whether you would subscribe to this thesis that also Antje Folma, former prominent Green Party members, supported that we are already at the early stage of a third world war. Or whether you believe that simply this is a specter, simply to find an agreement with Russia, whatever it costs or whether, 
and this could also be an alternative, whether we now move into the direction of another Cold War with Russia, where categories such as containment and already come back, things where we thought that this belongs to the past, which would also be a massive disappointment. See, I mean, we thought that this era of conflict and confrontation really belongs to the past. Now tell us, where do you see us now and versus Russia? How do we need to see this war? And what do you think? How should the European Union act? Thank you very much for this easy question. <laughs> well, first, let me tell you thank you for uh, this uh, very impressive conference. And the subject is very actual and threatened. And I want first to pay respect to Nemtsov, to the death of uh, very important, brave, and very clear fellow traveler. And I think, I hope, that uh, this is a turning point to assassinate such a man facing the Kremlin wall. Just uh, in the same time that they publish the Russian people that the exchange of uh, weapons, heavy weapons has been done, is something very clearly unacceptable. And by the same, thank you for the opportunity, I want to say all my respect to you, to the people fighting in Russia against dictatorship, against uh, assassination crimes. Thank you very much. So, I was very interested by what uh, Timothy said as a psychoanalyst. But this is difficult to explain. He was right. And the uh, German-Soviet pact was absolutely, let's say, for forgiven by all the new generation. And to explain what he explained us is a bit politically difficult. You were right, too right. So I don't want to comment what you have said, because it was not only an historian point of view, but a real uh, sociological and psychological point of view, yes. And to feign to fight against fascism in fighting against this generation of Ukrainian people it's very tricky coming from the Russians. Because they believe so in my country, some of us. But, and you quote that in your, uh, in your speak. Extreme rightist people in France, they are very numerous. And they are completely in agreement with extreme leftist people using the same words using the same analysis and greetings, strengths, virility, and a clear view guideline for a country. And uh, remember what we have said in the, the years back. We set up European Union to get peace on this continent, to get peace on the earth, to defend peace. And look now, 60 years after, we are coming back to the same situation. Not the same situation, this is not the same historical and economical situation, but the feeling of the people is the same. Nationalism, to fight against Europe. Because don't forget that for the time being, not in Germany, but in all the southern countries, Italy, Spain, Greece, of course, Portugal, France, we are crossing a very difficult economical crisis, unemployment, etc. And to explain what you have said, that in attacking Ukraine, 
not part of the European Union. They are attacking the European Union, and they are. Not officially, but the way they are, let's say, qualifying the European Union, of course, uh, the fight uh, against the, come on, the uh, indignity. This is very difficult to, to be supported in helping Ukraine in such a period of uh, insatisfaction in a certain number of countries. I don't want to talk about uh, Great Britain, but it is also the case. So, Putin is uh, clever enough to understand this uh, big crisis and big anxiety in some of the European countries. Are we ready to fight against or not? Because I want to play the bad guy. Analysis, expertise, you have. Very clearly, you are good. We were talking at lunchtime. And of course, this is absolutely necessary to understand all the experts' analysis. Yes, yes, yes. And the politicians are not used to do so. There is a concurrence. But no, let's say, common fight, unfortunately. Yes, we have to listen to the experts. But please, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to answer to our Ukrainian friends, of course, but also to the European people? Because for them, this is a very easy, and I want uh, to, to answer to your question precisely. Are you ready to fight against the Russian army? No, you are not. For the good reason that it was impossible during the 40 last, let's say even 50 last years, to talk about a European defense. We were out of the loop completely. Our goal was to make peace on the earth and certainly in between the European nation because we had centuries of fight. And of course, the last, the last world war, war and of course, the Holocaust and etc. So even the idea of maintaining a little budget for defense was out of the scoop. So my country tried to maintain a little army. Not so bad. Not so bad. So we ask you, German people, come with us against extre Muslim extremists in Mali. Nobody came. Just an example. The Brits, they were able to maintain a little army. But to work together in between France and Great Britain, yes, it was possible. But we work all together just to find a common budget, not a common army, my dear. It was out of, of the possibility of the dreams. No, but a common bud budget enough eventually to reinforce NATO is just coming now from the Baltic countries. So I'm coming back to my uh, bad guy demand. What are we supposed politically to do? I have a little answer, a bit humanitarian. We have to help our Ukra Ukrainian friends to go there, to visit them to stop, I mean, the propaganda. I have been several times in Maidan. It was not a fascist place where the extreme rightists were playing and attacking the police, not at all. It was very deep, the roots of the indignation. In the same time, they were talking to the population. They were asking for reforms. They were trying to fight against corruption. This was a deep movement. Not enough, OK, not enough. It's always not enough. But it was not at all. And sorry to say so, but the pictures you projected us were only pictures of war and fight. It was not the case. Maidan was a little place like my end. And all around, you were able to talk to the people. And they were trusting in a, a real 
let's say, reward, let's say, a sort of new life was coming for them. Of course, it takes time, a generation usually. So, thank you, there is one, and I, he came from my dad. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, what are, are the politicians supposed to do? We were very proud, honestly, when Madame Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande went there. It was not enough, of course it was not enough, but it was something. And it was something in the name of Europe. Not enough, not enough, not enough. And I don't want to criticize the document of Minsk too, but this is easy to criticize. It was also the victory of Putin, in a way. But we took that as some reaction against Barbary. So now, not only we have to talk to the people, but as you said, the green people visiting Russia. This is very good. If the Europe, we are 550 million of the richest people of the earth, European. Easy to visit, to go and talk to the people, etc., etc., to do something. And of course, to help the economy, to find a ways to offer a new picture of Ukraine, to prove to the Russian people that there is a new life, a democratic life, different from Russia, as a sort of, let's say, vitrine, uh, what do you call that, a show, if you will. That's nothing. And it will take certainly years and years. But the rest is a very risky military project. And nobody, even the American, even NATO, are for the time being ready to do so. So let's imagine, imagine an approach, a sort of friendly approach, if it is possible to use the word friendly, I'm sorry, after the assassination two days ago. But the rest is expertise, good expertise, and very good expertise. Thank you. <coughs> Vielen Dank, Bernard. Well, Bernard, thank you very much. I would like to ask Ms. Shevtsova to make a comment and to comment on what we have heard so far. But I also have a question to you, a question that you have to pose in Berlin. Now, part of our discussions focuses on the question, why have we lost Russia, indirectly speaking? And is there co-responsibility of the Western, of the American, of the European policymakers, of NATO policymakers for this aggravation, for this tension between Russia and the West? Or what are the root causes for this return to a policy of confrontation. Thank, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ralph. But uh, if you allow me, just one word. Looking at you and looking at Maria Louise, my dear friend, I want to thank you folks, and first of all, Bell Foundation in Moscow, for just being there in Russia for you know, uh, having one more independent platform for discussion. I'm not sure that you are going to be tolerated much more. I'm not sure, but still, you are there, OK? And I want, because they will never allow me to speak again, I want to say that there are so many people send their love to you, Marie Louise. Marie Louise Beck, Mikhail Kasyanov. And I know that Boris would have done the same you know, he would have embraced you because he loves you. He loved you, I'm sorry. Because you did so much, so many things in Moscow and Russia, uh, helping us to do what we are apparently helpless to do and helping our hopeless course, as you have said. Thank you. Thank you, the Greens. 
And by the way, one footnote to you. I am working for the American institution, but I am living in Russia and I am Russian political analyst. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm not covered by the US security umbrella. And uh, you know, uh, Ralph simply stopped me from asking the question because I love Bernard Kushner. I'm just, you know, I've been infatuated with you for so many years. But you know, uh, your line was in the end, uh, how to help Ukraine. We should visit Ukraine, we should talk to Ukrainians, etc. And my question to you was, how much more Putin should have helped you by seizing Mariupol, or maybe Kharkiv, maybe Odessa, or maybe invading hmm, Kyiv, why not? In order for you folks to do something much more, I would say, forceful, much more strong, you know, regarding Ukraine. But let it be a, a rhetorical question, Thank because, you. well, sanctions? Putin does not care about sanctions. Well, and responding to Ralph's question uh, about, about who is guilty, who is to blame, who lost Russia. I'm not sure that Russia was European, was yours to lose it. Yes, uh, uh, um, unfortunately not. Uh, yeah, yeah, the quote, the quote. I do believe continuing just wrapping up or following what Tim has said about Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. We in Russia for years have been discussing Schroeder um, Putin Pact, Angela Merkel Putin's Pact, <laughs> Berlin Moscow Pact until recently. Well, it seems to me that what we observe now, we observe a very interesting paradigm. I have a lot to add to Tim's inventory list, but one paradigm is definitely here. During the Soviet period, the Soviet Union survived by containing the West, by containing Europe, okay? Well, it failed to contain you. But during post-communist Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 1991, uh, post-communist Russia survived by co-opting you, by massaging you, by creating fifth column within European community. We don't call London, we call London Grad, okay? Well, uh, how many people are working for the Russian matrix and the Russian system? How many business people? How many lawyers? How many media people are on the Kremlin's payroll? That's why, you, of course, you be a responsibility for the monster you've massaged so long uh, in the Kremlin. But we saw that we saw that as a kind of engaging Russia, building up economic cooperation and Egon all kinds Bar, of societal, Egon Bar, societal politics and the rest. You know, these are not my heroes. Yes, so you prove that you are so naive. Because they've cheated you. They've cheated you. And now they took you unawares, not you and Maria Louise, because she knew when she traveled in order trying to save Khodorkovsky, she knew what she was doing. But you know, so many people, especially in Germany, were so naive. You know, from Russia with love. You still love it? And uh, strangely enough, it's not Americans who be a responsibility. Americans are far away, but Germany. Germany has been always the crucial factor for Russia. And until recently, at least, until I would say, until summer last year, until summer last year, Germany was the key enabler, the key accommodator. Partnership for modernization, Steinmeier, Schroeder, who else? Well, I, I don't want to continue the story. Uh, but it seems to me that somewhere in summer last year, Germany has changed its role. The Germany became a really serious factor, maybe crucial factor, keeping European unity, at least on the issue of sanctions. But I would agree with you, Ralph, when you said that apparently Minsk II, brokered by Chancellor Merkel and Hollande, hardly is durable for one reason. In fact, what you did what you two countries do, did to Ukraine. You've accepted the Russian trade-off. You've accepted and agreed to Russian political leverage over how the Ukrainian state should be constituted. In exchange, in exchange for the uh, withdrawal of the troops uh, remaining, you know, uh, uh, preserving the open borders. Well, isn't it the new irony? I bet Tim will write a new book about that.
Parts. <lacht> Michailo, ähm, <lacht> ihr, ihr Kommentar, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm used to it. <lacht> äh, Michailo, äh, ihr Kommentar aus... Your comment from a Ukrainian or Ukrainian democratic perspective, even if the next panel will more intensively talk about Ukraine and its perspectives, it is interesting now to learn more about the current development and about the hopes and expectations that you still have with regards to the European Union, if any. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me here. And uh, well, I had certain things to say to you, and I prepared well, believe me. I, I worked well. But after what I listened to Professor Snyder said and then discussion here, I, I want to say something different. Well, this hope and what Ralph called opt, uh, optimism import, the, the necessity of import to Ukraine, this optimism, it's critical, it's crucial. Yes, I agree, we, we are much harder aim for Kremlin than Kremlin expected us to be. And yes, Europe is definitely a much softer aim, I agree. But this being hardness, we paid such a huge price. I recall the times that we discussed issues, the future, 10 months ago, remember? Ukraine thinking together in Kiev, May, best time in Kiev. Today, uh, if I talk to people and bringing back the issue of what's going to be in future, I see empty eyes. There's no future anymore in the eyes. There's no, well, there is a hope, but it's well hidden. And it's so much important that the, the first and the biggest support from Europe, the help that we need, is giving us some uh, perspective, membership perspective. Well, we do need EU membership perspective. And uh, we also have a fear not of, only of non-EU future, but we also have this fear of the past. The, the time, the issues of time are critical here. And now I will recall my personal experience. I, in, at the moment when Soviet Union collapsed, I was a student in history in Zaporizhia. It, it is in my land that war goes on, and many of my friends are there. And in 1991, I was studying one course. It was called, in 1990, it was called uh, History of Communist Party of Soviet Union. It was a two-year-long course, so we started in September 1990. In January 1991, it was already called Political History of Soviet Union. Same professor, same program, same sources, Lenin, and so on. In December 1991, it was called Political History of Ukraine. Same professor, same program. <laughs> Same sources. Now I see that there is this reverse development going on brought by Kremlin. It's actually going on. I, I definitely see how the dead people from the mid 20th century holding legs of living in 21st and this fear of the past and fear of the future makes us to be very re uh, realistic. We, well, what Martin Heidegger would probably say, we are very deep in the present. Present. Yeah. We are very much now, we, we hear the, the voice of the being, and we react in political actions, in civic actions, very much. And we, we respond to the call of the being. It, you, in Ukraine, it's unimaginable movement of the activists, of the volunteers. Since we don't have other opportunity, we don't see future or the past, then we definitely want to make the difference now. Of course we are unpatient. Of course we want EU help us 
now. And th as I said, this help is the, the, the membership, perspective of the membership. And uh, I, I hope that after today's conversation, I, I was watching closely the, the situation in Berlin. How political elites, how power elites respond to the, what you call, guys, crisis, Ukrainian crisis. And I'm coming here to say it's not Ukrainian crisis. It's, thank you, it's European crisis and it's Eastern European crisis. And my message is that it should be treated as a regional crisis in our part of the land, in our part of the earth, just because uh, I was witnessing since 1991 as a historian and philosopher that we get more and more dividing lines. How enmity comes to our nations and societies not only from within, but between Russians and Ukrainians, Belarusians and Moldovans, and it's growing, it's, it was visible. And, well, intellectuals were trying to address it, but definitely not enough. And today, this regional crisis should be addressed together. And unity of Europe is being preserved, is being will, be, will be developed if we deal with this crisis. And it's the unity of the Eastern Europe, it's peace and rehabilitation of peaceful processes in Eastern Europe, and it can be done only with cooperation with the rest of Eastern Europe. And I will finish uh, with one message. I'm not a prophet. As a philosopher, I, uh, I believe that future uh, is only the one that we make by our own hands. But I will play a trick, and I say, if you will not help us to deal with Eastern European crisis, uh, Europe will end up as peninsula to Eurasian continent. Full stop. Timothy, and a replique. Timothy, would you like to answer to the various comments? And maybe I can also ask another question. Can you draw political conclusions from the analysis? And can you share these conclusions with us? On that analysis. So thank, thank you very much for the, the second chance to, to, to address um, these remarks. I have three or four responses. Uh, one goes to your question, your original question to Banakushnya about uh, the, whether this is or is not some kind of world war, or some new cold war, how to conceptualize it. I think if we want to conceptualize it globally, we have to get into the habit of talking about something which no one has mentioned and maybe won't be mentioned again, which is China. The, the, the way in which this is not a new Cold War uh, is primarily China. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union was more important and China was less important. Now, China is more important and Russia is less important. And the, the great diplomatic victory of, of Beijing um, is that uh, not only are they winning this war, they're the only ones who are winning, right? America's not winning, Europe's not winning, Russia's not winning, and Ukraine is not winning. All four are losing at the same time, which is pretty spectacular. And if you ask if everyone seems to be losing who is winning, the answer is China. Um, China is getting cheap natural gas from Russia. China is getting access to Ukrainian agricultural soil. Um, and, then, and perhaps most importantly, China is using Russia to test how far the international order can be challenged, weakened, undermined. Um, uh, Moscow says things that Beijing therefore doesn't need to say. So the, 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 the way in which this is a different kind of situation is that the Chinese are coming out on, on top. And by the way, they're the only ones whose diplomacy is, is at all sound. I mean, one thing that 
President Obama and President Putin have in common is that they can't go for two or three weeks without claiming some kind of victory or, or another, right? When in fact, both of them are losing at the same time. Um, the Chinese leadership is tactful enough not to declare victory all the time, right? And therefore, we don't pay attention to them, and they're the ones who, who, who are winning. The second way I think it's different from the Cold War, um, Lilia Shevtseva already, already mentioned, but I want to stress it and perhaps phrase it in a slightly different way. Uh, the propaganda is much different now than it was in the Cold War, and better. Um, there is no comparison between the quality and the technique of, of Russian propaganda now and Soviet propaganda in the 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s. You'd have to go back to the 1930s, I think, for there even vaguely to be a comparison. But I think e e now what we have is, still qual is, is, is quite different. It's different in technique. Um, there are new media. But it's also different in how it's supposed to work, right? In the 1920s and 1930s, there was still a vision of, whatever you think of it, there was a vision of a revolution in the future. Um, there was a vision of, of progress. In Russian propaganda today, there is no vision of progress. There's no good thing in the world. They're just a series of conspiracies, one after the other, that you're supposed to believe in and then not believe in. And as you believe in them and not believe in them, you slowly, you slowly use your ability to think about the world at all. It's a propaganda which is meant to destroy your ability to think. Um, and I've already made my point that it's working. Um, and in that sense, it's not a Cold War either, because the basic goal of Russian policy is not for there to be a revolution in France or whatever, or, or Italy. The basic goal is to break things down, break down the transatlantic relationship, break down the European Union, break down individual member states, break down civil society, bring things down to their lowest common denominator. So there's no positive vision at, at, at all. And in that way, it's different. Now, on, on to the question of what can be done, which in a way was also Bernard's question of, of what can be done and, and, and Lilia's and, and Mikhailo's. Uh, it seems to me that um, the, 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 the politic, one basic political conclusion of what I tried to say is that Europe has a political theory um, and that you have to remember what the political theory is. And if you don't remember what it is, then you can't support it. And I think, I mean, you can all correct me because despite what Ralph was kind enough to say, I'm not, I'm not a European, you know, so you can, you can point, point at my, and you know, and I, I do have the, what, what is, I have the protection of the Americanische Schutzmacht, right? What, the thing that, the thing that, the thing that Lilia does not have, I, I, I have that thing. Let's, let's see how, let's see how much that helps me, right? But, um, uh, but, but um, it, it, it seems to me that um, there is a theory and the theory is something like you, you support civil society, which goes under different names. Civil society makes the state a rule of law state, right? The Reichsstaat doesn't come out of nowhere. To have a Reichsstaat, you have to have civil society. And European integration at the top solves some of the weaknesses of a sovereign state, the economic weaknesses, the political weaknesses, and so on, right? You, you have a kind of theory. And the problem with the European Union is you don't really talk about what your theory is. Like things just go really well because they go really well and ever closer union and the Americans will help us out if anything goes wrong. And now we've reached the moment where the Americans aren't going to help you out. And it's the, the irony of this historical moment, as I see it, and here I will be American for a minute, is that the moment when America's doing nothing, right, when America's pulling out, that's the moment where everyone wants to say, oh, the Americans are responsible. No, 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 no. And no, I mean, as a, as a characterization, as a characterization that's wrong, and as an expectation that's wrong, and moving back to psychoanalysis, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a kind of displacement. Yeah, it's a kind of it's a kind of displacement, right? Let's let's talk about the Americans because we don't want to talk about ourselves or about what's really about what's really happening. So the things that have to happen have to happen in the European Union, and I don't think it's so crazy to talk about a European defense policy. I think it's crazy not to talk about one. Um, the Russian army is not. I mean, the Russians have, have a real army. There aren't that many real armies in the world. They have a real army. It has maybe 50 to 70,000 men who can fight. That's a big army compared to armies that don't exist, right? But in a, in, in the, in, right now, what we're, what we're in is like, you know, in, in, the world of, in the world of men with no arms, the one armed man is king, right? It's not as though the Russian army is this unstoppable, you know, endless horde of robots. It, it is, it, it's, it's an army. You could, Germany could have a bigger one if it wanted to. And if the European Union, and I realize that we're talking, you know, this is, you know, Musik der Zukunft, but if the European Union just had a strike force of 15,000 men and women, that would change things immensely, but you don't, right? Just 15,000 or an officer corps, just an officer corps, a military academy. And I, I find it actually quite strange that this is not being discussed now because, I mean, and now, you know, I'll just give you very traditional on you. You cannot have foreign policy without an army, not because you use it, 
But just because if you don't have it and someone else does, you find yourself in these weird situations like, like Merkel and Hollande found themselves in, where they have, you know, these are immensely stronger countries. They're immensely stronger countries. And I agree that it was a very good thing that President Hollande went along. I see the political logic. But these are immensely stronger countries who are getting killed at the bargaining table. Right? They're getting killed at the bar. And why is that exactly? Well, because only one country has an army. That's why. Oh, I shouldn't say only one country because when we talk about the Ukrainians, you know, whatever one says about the problems of the Ukrainian state, I'm sure more will be said about it, they actually did put an army in the field and fight, right? They actually did put an army in the field and fight. And a lot of it had to, a lot of it was volunteers and a lot of it was de facto volunteers. But they did actually put an army in the field and fight. And when we talk about, you know, who's defending Europe and what Europe should be done, that's something which I think ought to be remembered. Anyway, what can be done? If you have a political theory, and your political theory is about civil society, sovereignty, and the European Union, then you have to support civil society in Russia, in Belarus, in Ukraine, and at home, because one of the things the Russians are doing, as Lilia Shevtsova knows better than me, is they're trying to get inside civil society here and in America and, and discredit it. So the idea of civil society is very important. The most immediate thing is to strengthen the Ukrainian state in every way that we can strengthen the Ukrainian state. So like the whole debate about ceasefire, delivering weapons, delivering weapons, ceasefire, that's a false debate because it's between two kinds of political consumerists. They're the ones who say, oh yes, give them some American weapons, that'll make a difference. That, that won't really make much difference. And then they're the ones who say, let's have a ceasefire, that will make a difference. That doesn't make a difference either. In both cases, the desire is a short-term solution to a long-term problem. The only way to address a long-term problem is to find ways to build up the Ukrainian state, which is not easy. You have to work with Ukrainian NGOs, you have to work with the parts of the ministries that are functional, you have to take time and patience to build up these institutions. But for me, that's the, that's the most pressing response to your question. Bernard, you have already called. Bernard, you are claiming the floor. Whatever you wanted to say. In German foreign policy, it is still true, and as far as I see it, this is what political parties subscribe to. It's still true that. European security can only be guaranteed with Russia. European security can only be guaranteed with Russia. This implies not against Russia. Would you turn this equation around? Uh, now knows the time. Uh, I agree with Dr. Snyder. Yes, and uh, the only way to live with threat is also Russia. So you know, this is uh, security and war in the same time. This is not true. This is not true because uh, we felt, certainly, to set up European Union. Remember, we were supposed to set up a sort of particular, a new adventure in politics. And we failed because it was impossible to realize or to see the reality of the surrounding. So we have to correct that. This is easy to say. But please, let me come back to some. Oh, I, I don't share completely what Tim said about uh, uh, China, because China is a problem with Japan and with India and with Southern Korea, and we'll see. But for the time being, they are not threatening us. They are just uh, trying to equip their army enough to sell them one of those days, but not now. We are facing Russia. And I'm not shy dish. And I don't say only, my dear, that we have to cross the border to kiss the Russian on the lips. No, unfortunately, sometimes. <laughs> and uh, well, I say that we are not ready and we don't want to fight against the Russian army. We, the European people, and as Mr. President Obama was very clear, it's a European problem. So what is possible to do? OK, improving the army and the idea of uh, European defense, it would take years, etc. Certainly, yes. But we have to find the way in having contact with the people. I mean, the French people are not visiting Ukraine. And the rest of Europe, not enough. And it seems to be completely childish to go and talk. This is not at all childish. NGOs, 
foundation, political parties, everything. Meanwhile, we have, sorry for that, to reforce the sanctions, because this is our only useful weapons for the time being. Sorry for that. Sorry for that, but we have to. And don't forget that the gas is coming from Russia to Germany and not from Germany to Russia. And there is a threat all over, not in my country, because 75% of the gas is coming from Algeria and Norway. But the rest, if Mr. Putin is turning the tap, the target is you, not the Russian people. So this is a complicated situation. But look, wh what else? Is it possible to find something else? The politicians, they need to face and to have, well, to face the, the public opinion. In all the countries, look at the polls. Of course, to go to war, you don't have to make a poll. You have to go to war. But this is not exactly the same thing now. European Union, make of 28 nations, should find in between a sort of consensus. It will take years and years, years and years. Look something, okay for the Chinese threat, but I know another threat where we are very far from a common attitude. This is Islamist extremist. This is Daesh. This, what are we doing against European Union in the name of? We are supposed to get a sort of Minister of Foreign Affairs, a European Minister of Foreign Affairs, I was part of. This is impossible even to talk with all the foreign ministers. This is possible, but it takes time and time and months and years. Sorry, so we are unable to see in Syria, in Iraq, but everywhere in the world, another threat coming. I don't want to play the whole story, but we have some emergency situation. So. Sorry to disappoint myself. I'm not, I'm more, I was more humanitarian than a, a warrior, but I, I know that we have to mix that humanism and strength, I mean, strong attitude with an army. How to do so? Sorry, we have to invent the European people this way, this very snaky way, difficult to find the path in between the economical sanction to be reforced and physical intervention step by step to tell the Russian people that we will not stay inert. For the time being, they are advancing and we are not. On the country, we are stepping back. So this is not the good attitude. Let's invent something like humanitarian military attitude. I don't know the way, but I'm sure that there is nothing proposed nowhere. So I'm doing something else. Okay. Vielen Dank. Ja, ja. Lilia, auf die Gef Lilia, even at the risk of being naive here, I would like to insist on the following question. Do you see political space for compromises with Putin's Russia? Is there leeway for you to find political solutions with Russia? although there's confrontation with an unknown result. And what could these compromises look like? Not at the expense of Ukraine, of course, because that has been the proposal that has been made to us, saying, hey, let us communicate at the expense of Ukraine. But if you reject that, if you insist upon the fundamental principles of the European order, where do you then see a possibility to balance interests with Russia, or do, do you think this is a complete illusion? Uh, first of all, Ralph, uh, when I was talking about naivete, I was excluding the Greens. I'm not so sure if I'm representative for the Greens, but go on. 
<laughs> uh, you know, you're raising the deadly question for the time being, and I will try uh, to respond with my own Moscow naivete in the following way, in a way of brush strokes. Firstly, I do not believe that we have crisis. I'm sorry, Mike, Mik Mikhail. Uh, that we have Eastern European or whatever crisis. Crisis always is, you know, uh, already it includes the elements of understanding of how to get out. Crisis, and Bernard knows much more as a medician, as a doctor. Crisis could be a way, a way either to death or to some kind of cure, okay? So we at the moment have some kind, some stage of confrontation. Not only geopolitical, but first of all, civilizational confrontation. That, by the way, the Kremlin agrees to admit. Europe and the West do not agree to admit, uh, preferring the word crisis, because it's softer, it's more flexible, it doesn't demand drastic decisions. This is firstly. Secondly, uh, I agree with Tim on his definition of the Cold War. I would say the current confrontation is much more is much more complicated, dangerous, threatening than the previous Cold War. Why? Because Russia is inside of your body, because you Europeans, well, you are not retirement house, as Brzezinski said, but the West is very close to the retirement house, have lost trajectory and forgot about principles. And thirdly, because Russia, Putin's Russia, is not about new Yalta or Potsdam or whatever. Uh, current Putin's Russia, current Putin's Kremlin, is about forcing the West through Ukraine, Ukraine is a testing field, to acknowledge, to admit, and to give Russia and any other strong power the right to interpret the rules of the game and undermine it. So it's about undermining the rules of the game. The Soviet Union, by the way, followed the rules of the game, and this is the difference. And this makes the situation much more tragic and much more dramatic. So well, uh, uh, what about the third point? What could be, could, could be there any kind of compromise with current Putin scrambling? My hunch is not. At least not through the sanctions regime, because sanctions, sanctions it's merely tactics. Sanctions means, you know, well, tactics compensate for lack of strategy. And sanctions, well, hardly ever, with the exception of Belarusian case, only partially sanctions have been successful. Or maybe, you know, in the South Africa in those times, not anymore. Well, but what apparently could be done, I would say you can do a compromise with Putin so far at the moment, having this kind of European unity and the Western complacency and weakness only on the Kremlin's terms. Or you should apply some much more drastic instruments beyond sanctions, beyond sanctions, in order to force Putin to backtrack, which would mean collapse of Putin's regime. But are you ready to see collapse of Putin's regime? Are you ready of unknown? Are you ready of unpredictable situation that could emerge? With current Putin's Kremlin, hardly you can find a compromise which would preserve Ukrainian dignity, your dignity, and Putin's uh, agreement. I'm sorry. Well, this is looking into the abyss, which means that apparently you are on the verge Maybe in Mariupol or some next drama will be needed to force you to go beyond Minsk too, which will include not only Marshall Plan for Ukraine, plus conditionality, plus conditionality forcing Ukrainians to do real reforms. Secondly, maybe it's not 3% of the EU budget uh, like Kubilius wants. Maybe it's not $50 billion like Soros suggests, but something much more than 17.5 billion. It's not enough. Secondly, you cannot reach anything, you cannot prevent Russia from crossing the borders if you do not help Ukrainians to secure the borders, to secure the borders. That's the question. And this is the key to solution of the Ukrainian question. And for the time being, you have to skip over these hypocritical things. There is no military solution. 
there are situations when there are military solutions. Well, you have to skip over some kind of, you know, we have to respect Ukrainian, sorry, Mikhailo, territorial integrity. But this is hypocrisy. Because, in fact, the formula of Minsk II means that, you know, Russia forced Ukraine to accept back you know, uh, these uh, two republics that would be a kind of, you know, poisons, wounds within the Ukrainian body. Apparently, Ukraine will have to recognize that it will, will have for some indefinite time occupied territories and start building, you know, the normal life at the rest of the territory. So we have to get rid of the sacred cause. We, we have to be more courageous. Uh, and uh, sorry for my naivete. Michelle, any comment on that? Mikhail, would you like to comment on that? No. Uh, <laughs> well, I think that Russia has quite a weak army. It's big, but it's not that effective. Also, there's definitely an economic problem there. There's definitely a leadership problem. If you create an authoritarian regime, you have very short time of effective governance. It's mathematically proven already. We have thousands of years of authoritarian regimes and we know how they function. So Putin makes more and more mistakes. But what is on the side of Kremlin is the will. Not wisdom, not resources, but the will. And this is definitely the deficit that West has. And that's probably what should be discussed. If there's any will to survive, to that, well, I don't want to use essentialist words, civilization, or whatever, but people living in this to-be peninsula, do you really want to face uh, these practices that Kremlin introduces in neighboring countries and go on with in, into your political systems, into your political bodies? Do you really want in two years to face Edina uh, Rasiya in, in your own country? Well, th there should be not only reaction to what Kremlin does, but the will means to be proactive, to help Russia survive until the moment when, well, authoritarian rulers, thanks God, have the limit in their lives. What will be the next? What will be after Putin? So, democratic Russia definitely needs help, definitely needs assistance. We in Ukraine are ready to help democratic Russia. Well... Thank you. Yes. <laughs> then we definitely need a help to democratic Ukraine. Economic, defense, security, yes. Please help democratic Belarus, democratic Moldova. Please, we have the region with problems. We know about them. We don't even need to create anonymous Eastern Europeans. We know about our problems and we're ready to face and fight for them. Civil society, is very active in Ukraine and we're dealing what we can. And thank to Svetlana, we also have our people in parliament. Thank to many friends uh, from Maidan, we have them in ministries, in government. Yes, there is power elites with their practices and values. We fight a lot with them, but we need help. We need help of democratic West and we need your will to be proactive. Ich muss noch mal eine Nachfrage I have a follow-up question. Tell me more about your position when it comes to the suggestion, I don't want to call it strategy, to this political idea to say that Ukraine is not able with its own forces to have control over Crimea and Donbas and the West is either not willing or not able to do this neither. And therefore, the best solution would be to simply go for 
a status quo situation, freeze this situation, and then focus on making Ukraine successful. Would you say that this is an acceptable idea and position? And it's probably the only viable solution for the entire region. Successful Ukraine means successful Eastern Europe, safe Eastern Europe. And it means safe Europe, including Western Europe. So basically, if we have democratic movements survived and winning in Kyiv, well, we definitely have the future for the Minsk, for Minsk, for uh, Donetsk, and for uh, uh, Moscow. But also, in, you know, what's the difference between Belarusians and Ukrainians? When you go to Belarus, they say, oh, guys, you are so emotional. But emotional also means bad planners. So we have to learn how to plan well. We definitely need a strategy of like two generations ahead. Mm. And it's going to be the strategic patience for 50 years how to get back Crimea and Donbass. Thanks a lot. Gibt es denn dringende Fragen? Are there urgent follow-up questions or comments from the audience to our panel members? And if so, please keep yourself brief. Please use the microphone. And maybe we can start with the lady over there in the back. And please bear with me when I cannot give all of you the floor. So brief, introduce yourself. Hello, I am Ludmila Melnik. I'm with the initiative Ukrainian for a European Country. Today there was a question, i.e., how can we help our Ukrainian friends? And I'd like to make a few suggestions to you. I'd like to concentrate first on the media, on the German media to be precise. You know, we in Germany, we always use the following terms, federalism, radicalism, federalization, failed state, you know, Russia, Russian minority, the rights of the Russian minorities, uh, which are oppressed, Crimea as a original Russian territory and others. Worst of all this, and I would even say the most ridiculous, is that all these terms were not invented by us. Rather, we took these terms that come from Russia and simply repeat them, and they come from the Kremlin. So, in fact, we are the puppets of the Kremlin. And I ask myself, why have we, up until this day, even though the crisis, the war, has now lasted for a year, not managed to kick off our own discourse? For instance, I would love to see a new discourse where we talk about German and Ukrainian relationships. I mean, of course, the Ukraine has not only gained independence in 1991, we have relationships between the two countries that are more than 100 years old. Let's also talk about the Ukrainians as a people. Ukraine was not just a part of Soviet Union, but also it was uh, dependent on Russia and Austria and with good relationships. And I know a lot of Germans who lived in the Ukraine in Ukraine and maybe they can also share with us how they live their lives let's talk about the crimes there that happen there on the ground not just with one term but simply to understand why people in Ukraine then also welcome the Nazis with open arms and you Mr. Fuchs you said that so far we react and I think we need to act Okay, let's be pragmatic. Please simply hand over the mic to the person next to you. I'm Ibrahim Matsai. I work in Ingolstadt at the university, and I would like to make two cynical comments. First, when it comes to Libya and Iraq, we immediately got an army. When it comes to Ukraine, there are no united armed forces or something like this. Second, when the frozen conflict term was used, several times, and it seems that both players, the EU and Russia, 
danced the tango together because in 1994 the conflicts ended in Moldova, Transnistria, Bergkarabakh, and there Europe and the United States accepted Russia's conditions, 2008, Georgia, and uh, also, so they were quite consistent. I mean, so why should we protest? Okay, please pass on the mic to the person next to you. Good evening. I'm Linkai. I'm a private person here, and I have a short question to Ms. Kushmar. Mr. Kushmar, uh, of course, I have to refer to the translation I got, and if I understand you correctly, you asked the question whether we are willing to fight with the Russian army. And I guess the headline is, of course, that we don't want to fight with them or against them. No. And I would like to know whether you had also asked this question a few months ago before the events in Paris. And had you also asked that the people in Paris would be willing to take to the streets, millions even, and uh, I don't really understand why your answer is no. I mean, if it is really necessary, I guess we will go for it. Okay, then we have another person on the other side of the aisle. Gabi Deutscher, I'm with Druck e.V. You emphasize that Russia is lost for the European Union. And I believe that doesn't cover the whole picture. If you see how the young generation a few years ago, especially in Novosibirsk, in Moscow and other cities, took to the streets to also stand up for European values, then this should not be overlooked. And I think the aspects of dialogue have not been mentioned today sufficiently. There are contradictions. Nevertheless, it's very important to have a dialogue with the young generations. And I think it is the right step that our association, Verein Druck, takes. We had a trilateral Ukrainian-Russian-European Youth Forum last year in Berlin. We'd like to also organize this next year in Moscow and in Kiev. And I think this is the approach we need to take. Well, we will definitely support you. We are absolutely in favor of keeping a dialogue with the civil society. So now in the very back, two gentlemen. Andre Novak, I'm with the Greens, uh, Eastern, Europe, Eastern Europe platform. I have a question to Lilia Shevtsova. Lilia, you said that the Kremlin leadership uh, doesn't really react to sanctions. But wouldn't you say that currently all reserve funds, central bank reserves, pension funds are being tapped into to maintain the illusion of an economic stability in the country as long as possible and what will happen afterwards and isn't this therefore something that causes a headache to the Kremlin and to the colleague from Kiev a question uh, don't you think that Europe also betrays its own values by having an iron curtain 2.0 with the Schengen agreement and whether this is not also fodder for the approach in the Kremlin. And Ms. Kuchner, you, Mr. Kuchner, you worked for the UNMIC in Kosovo. What would you think? How successful could a mission of blue helmets be in Ukraine? And Timothy Slater, also a question to you. You said that the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was a key moment for the beginning of the Second World War. To my opinion, the key moment is the blood, sweat, and tears speech of Winston Churchill that kicked everything off. And who gives this speech today? Oh, wow. My name is Hans Jetsen. I'm a journalist. Last week in Berlin, there was another highly ranked discussion on Russia-Ukraine with Alexander Sushko from the Institute for Euro-Atlantic Cooperation in Kiev. He analyzed Putin's interests, and the question is directed to Timothy Schneider. Shusko says that Putin is not even interested in conquering eastern areas of Ukraine in the long run, but he only conquers them to then swap them to raise the mood in the West 
and to get other concessions. So Ukraine will then not be independent and able to take its own action. It is a type of revisionism that allows Putin to embark on a path that helps him to get back to the situation prior to 1991. So Putin doesn't want to keep the areas in the east, but simply have it as a guarantee, as a security to get further concessions from the west. And a second question, maybe also to Snyder and Mr. Kushner, the weakness of Europe. Is it wrong to believe that, and I add, we should not forget, that Europe in the past few weeks decided not to deliver any arms to Ukraine. And there was a second part to this decision, which says, but they wouldn't mind if single European states would send arms to Ukraine. And this now means, uh, in connection with the red lines that were drawn by Mr. Schneid Steinbeier, Mayopol, can we believe that once these red lines are crossed, that there will indeed be weapons deliveries from some NATO states to Ukraine. And in connection to this, if political pressure is exerted, there are always two options. First, pressure can either divide and lead to separation, but pressure can also lead to a merger. And my impression is that currently the political pressure that comes from Russia rather leads to the situation that within the European Union, the nations join forces and find a joint approach. I think now we take two more comments in the front. We only have time for two more. I mean, in fact, this was already enough for another evening event. Andreas Umland is my name. About absurdities in um, in these uh, in this conflict, but I think maybe the main absurdity, or at least one of the main absurdities. What yes, was not yet um, explicitly mentioned, uh, uh, Bernard Kushner indicated it, but th that is the very simple fact that Russia is a petro state, and if you look at the at the how the Russian budget, state budget, is composed, then much of it is so-called foreign economic activity, and this foreign economic activity is simply to, la to, to the largest degree is pumping oil. Where, where does this oil go? It goes to the European Union. We are financing this petro state, which finances itself by its selling petroleum. And this is, I think, a, a huge absurdity that is going on. I think gas is here a distraction to a certain degree because it's much less important for the Russian budget than oil, and the oil that we buy from Russia could be much easier than the gas that we buy from Russia, replaced with oil from other regions of the world, especially in the current situation. In fact, we are indirectly, I would even argue, financing this whole thing in, in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Ukraine. Thank you. And you can speak Russian. There is uh, translation, yeah, Russian. Um English term. Well, I came to this conference tonight uh, because of the anniversary of the annexation. I was an eyewitness of what happened there in Crimea. And I also represent the Committee on the Protection of the Krim Tatars. And I do not fully agree with the thesis we just had from the colleague from Ukraine. Because when we talk about hybrid war, then I think that hybrid war needs to be responded to with a hybrid defense. And this works. We know about the situation in the and connected Ukraine and how it has changed. If we talk about a hybrid defense, we also need to talk about Ukraine itself. Ukraine itself should turn into a subject and not remain an object. And also the Crimean Tatar population should turn into active subjects because they are the victims of all that's going on. And if we join forces, 
This is important. See, for instance, for three weeks now, I haven't been able to return to Crimea because when I talked about human rights in Crimea, I was criminalized. I simply criticized human rights violations in Crimea. And when we say that we could set up a civil society in Russia, I mean, then you should know about the pressure these people suffer from. In Crimea, we set up a civil society. But those, also in Crimea, but those people who spoke up openly, they need to leave the region. And when I return to Crimea, I will be arrested. And this is something that I wanted to mention, because I would love to discuss all the questions here today so that we can come up with serious ideas and suggestions what the Ukrainian parliament can do, what they could adopt so that people finally understand who is the master on Crimea and also that people in Russia understand who holds the power in Crimea. Thank you so much for all your contributions. Now we come to a short final round and we give the floor to the panel members. And of course, uh, we cannot answer all questions, so please take the one or two questions that are, were directed to you or that seem to be the most attractive ones to you and then give a short answer. And maybe we start with Lilia. Yeah, uh, thank you. Very briefly, there was one question directed to me on sanctions. I believe that sanctions should be preserved at least until the Kremlin stops destabilize Ukraine. But at the same time, I would say that sanctions, as, as I've said already, it's only tactics on the part of the European states and the United States of America in the situation when they don't have the view of what the post-Crimea world should be. That's why I think that Putin will give ample opportunity to Europeans, to you folks, and the United States of America to think about the post-Crimea landscape. Well, and you have to use this opportunity. Putin has been helping you a lot to find new mission, to find new trajectory, and to reanimate, to refurbish NATO and other institutions. So let's give Putin his due. Well, definitely, Schengen visa regime is something that is very hu unfair to Ukraine. It's humiliation, and you know, U Europe as a fortress is also a project of European Union. Let's face it, and the cynical part of European Union is now being used by Kremlin, and it's the, actually the Trojan horse. Uh, that makes you inefficient and maybe even more than just vulnerable. Well, what concerns Crimea? Well, uh, we, we may pronounce whichever speeches we want, but it's definitely the long strategy only. Uh, there's no, currently there's no solution to this uh, situation. I would love to have a magic stick and return to, the, to what we had. And again, as I said, Kremlin uses contradictions that are on the local level in uh, member states of EU, but also in Ukraine. For 20 years, we had apartheid in communities of Crimean Tatars, Russians, and Ukrainians. And there were groups that tried to fight this, but apartheid was in the place, and Kremlin was using it in uh, a year ago. They used it well, they got annexation, and now it should be very wise strategy how to reconnect Crimean Tatar community, Russian community for democratic European values. Thanks a lot, Bernard. Thank you. On sanction, I disagree with you. I'm very sorry. But there is another example of uh, well done sanction, Iran. And uh, I believe that on the country will reinforce sanction with precise and as uh, with a sweat sanction, well done, uh, like we did in, in Iran, in between all the, net, the banking networks. So on the country, I believe that uh, this is uh, efficient. Second, 
Uh, yes, when the, it was, uh, uh, there was a possibility to protect Benghazi against the bombing of Mr. Gaddafi. Yes, we had only by air an alliance in between the Brits and the French. This is not the best uh, mission and the results were not so good. Hmm? But it was absolutely not the same enemy. We just have to attack some tanks in the desert. We did. Look at the result. Second, uh, well, Kosovo, I want to talk about that. Kosovo. Yes, we decided, we, not the European community, all the world through the UN system, we decided after big, long, very long, well, I'm very uh, sorry for the material. Let it be, let it be. Let it be yes. Uh, we decided to separate one piece of land to the other. Was it possible to find a new solu another solution? No. People were killing each other, and the massacres were absolutely impossible to support. So 15 years after, 15 years, we were talking about a generation. 15 years after, despite of all the incident, Serbs, people are talking with Kosovo people, and things are getting better. Better than what? Not the ideal solution, but better than war. Better than mass massacres. Certainly better. So after that, I remember what uh, Lavrov said, and Putin said, OK, you did that in Kosovo. You will see for the frozen wars. Moldova, Ukraine, Baltic, etc." He told that to us, and especially at the Security Council. So is it the same situation? No. Uh, we were in agreement with all the international community. It has been, uh, I think that, uh, more than 100 countries recognized Kosovo, 110, or I don't know right now. And things are getting better if, in case of all, like Croatia already is part of the European Union, Serbia and Kosovo will go together in the European Union. It will take years and years. And after all the federation and all, all the analysis and all the, uh, the suggestion of the project will be done. So it was not the same thing. Um, and I, I forgot one question. Somebody here, we're talking about what? UN Sorry? UN mission. What's about a UN mission? Blue helmet, UN mission. An international mission. Oh, the UN mission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's why I have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't want to blame my people and, and to insult them. But you know, UN mission, you have two missions. Peacemaking mission, you have to fight. Peacekeeping mission. And it was always peacekeeping mission. So to separate the former enemies. But peacemaking mission, you need troops able to fight and uh, not a, a law, able to accept and this is really not the case right now. Two reasons. First, veto from <laughs> Russia, and certainly veto from China. We don't know. So there is no peacemaking or peacekeeping mission without the consent of the Security Council. Second, this is always the same countries sending troops able to fight, modern, well-equipped, etc. So, if we have a success in maintaining the peace in Ukraine, it will be certainly part of, let's say, coming years solution with UN troops along the so-called, sorry to say, borders or separation. But before, it's absolutely impossible. Like OSCE, uh, this is not their work, this is not their desire to stop the war completely. But after stopping the war, yes, we can, uh, we can turn to the Security Council or the SCE or the European uh, say mission, yes.
Timothy, please. Okay, so I would like to, to, to briefly address the question about Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast from the back and then group together some of the other questions in, in a general remark about the long, the long term. On, on Donetsk and Luhansk, I, I don't think uh, I could still be proved wrong, but I don't think there's any Russian interest in actually annexing these places or in improving the lives of the people who, who live there. I mean, ha had there been such a desire, you know, in, invading and getting the regions destroyed was not the best way to fulfill it. I think the talk about protecting the rights of Russian speakers is absolutely empty and should be, and, and, and the consequence has, of course, taken, taken place. Um, there are very few Russian speakers in Ukraine who are better off because Russia invaded the country, let's put it that way. Um, but in, in, in terms of tactics, I think the original idea was that taking Crimea would suffice to bring the Ukrainian state down. And when that didn't happen, I think the next idea was that the intervention in Donetsk and Lugansk would, would, uh, would suffice to bring down the Ukrainian state. When the Ukrainian state did not collapse, I mean, for all of its weaknesses, when it did not collapse, Donetsk and Luhansk became what they are now, which is one way among many of weakening the European Union. So I think the, the desired outcome of Minsk II is that these places stay in a, a, a gray zone. Russia accepts no responsibility for them. Ideally, the European Union through Ukraine sends in a lot of money and local Russian backed politicians take credit for it. I think that's what they're going for now and they're pretty close to getting it. Um, on, uh, I want to group together a bunch of questions on the issue of time because it seems to me that a lot of them have to do with the short term, long term, and that in a way the, the European problem um, is that you're facing someone who has a who has a long-term strategy. It's not a great strategy, but it is a long-term strategy, and you're responding to it with a series of short-term impulsive things. Um, so I want to try to take a step back and suggest that time is, in a way, quite crucial. So you, you cited in the back, Mr. Novak, I think it was, you cited the, um, the, the blood, sweat, and tears speech. Thank you for that. The blood, sweat, and tears speech, of course, took place during the Molotov-Ribbentrop period, right? And the reason why Britain was all alone was because the Soviet Union was sending fuel, right, for the Luftwaffe to bomb London um, and sending food from Soviet Ukraine to feed German troops, right, who marched into France and conquered it. So it's a, it's a, it's a speech which should be remembered, and I'll return to it, but the context is actually the molotov ribbentrop context. In other words, we don't have to choose between your favorite moment and my favorite moment because they're the same, they're the same moment, actually. Um, the blood, sweat, and tears speech took place when the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were, in fact, allies. But this just brings me to what I take as the, the, the fundamental question here, which is short-term versus long-term. Because when Churchill talks about they're only offering blood, sweat, and tears, what he's saying is the struggle is going to be a long one, right? That's the point of the speech. The struggle is going to be a long one. And he's, and he's absolutely correct. And I think a lot of the ways that we have to think about this conflict is that it's going to last more than four years, as the Second World War did from a German, from a, or, or six years from a, from a British point of view. It's going to last at least that long, probably longer. And when we think about it that way, then the question, the, the question that Andreas Umland brings up of energy policy, of course, becomes fundamental. The obvious way to respond and to have a common European initiative, which is not bellicose, but which preserves European structures, is to have a common energy policy. That's the obvious way. That's the obvious long-term response. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, to, 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 um, to Andreas for bringing it up. And when I mentioned China, I didn't mention it to say that there was a Chinese threat. My point in mentioning China is that um, it's a long-term question who is actually winning this struggle. And when we think about where Russia is going, we shouldn't just think about Russia's threats or Russia's immediate power or the fact that Russia can conquer a, a tiny bit of Ukraine. What we should be thinking about is Russia's power position, which depends upon balancing between China and the European Union. One of the things which is likely to happen over the long run is that Russian elites this Russian elite or the next Russian elite will think they've tilted too far towards China and for purely self-interested reasons want to tilt back towards the West. And we have to be ready for that because what they're doing now is racing towards China. Even within the Kremlin, there are people who understand that that may not be the best idea. So there's something that's, that's, that's a long-term issue about Russian power. 
And I want to stress that um, Russian power itself, and especially the power of the Kremlin, is more limited sometimes than it seems. And w if, if Europe plays a long game, it does, it does have an awful lot of weapons. Part of what happens, I think, is that Europe is dazzled by tyranny a little bit. You know, and admittedly, tyranny is, is sort of dazzling when you get used to bureaucratic, democratic rule. But whether this regime is going to be in power when the Ukraine crisis is settled, I, you know, it's an open question. The Ukraine crisis will probably outlive the Putin regime. So the entire way of thinking about this, can we do a deal with Putin or not, is in some sense short-term thinking. One has to be ready to, 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 for what's going to happen in a situation when this crisis is still going on and the Russian regime changes. In other words, it's just another way of saying that this is going to be a long, a, a long-term issue. And then the last thing I wanted to say is that when you cite Churchill in blood, sweat, and tears, right, um, that, is, that is a moment when, when, when the British were alone. So in some sense, in some sense, it's optimistic. Because where were the Europeans when Churchill was giving that speech, right? Where were the Europeans then? Britain was all alone. And the remarkable thing is they won anyway. So when we look back at the Second World War, there are, and I hope perhaps this is something you were suggesting, there are some reasons not to be entirely denuded of hope. And one of the long-term reasons is that in Ukraine today, and within Russia too, I take the point, I take your point, there, are, there is a generation of people who are committed to Europe. And part of the tragedy, as Mihailo pointed out, of the current situation is that we can lose these people to despair and to cynicism if we don't do something more. The people who are enthusiastic about Europe are largely east of the European Union. That's a long-term resource which we might get or we might not get. It depends on what we do. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's why not my That was a very optimistic note at the end of the discussion, which started in an apocalyptic way and ended with Realpolitik. And we have heard quite a few concrete inputs and ideas. I can't really summarize all of them, but one thing that I definitely remember is that we must not allow others to divide us. The conflict with Russia should be used as a momentum to foster European integration, including strengthening European defense. And a second undisputed element is the following. We need to do everything to foster and support democratic civil society organizations, both in Russia and in Ukraine. And a third aspect, increase sanctions, targeted sanctions that hit the power elites of Russia, especially in the financial sector, because they are very vulnerable. Then the fourth aspect, and that might be the crucial aspect, is we need to do everything to stabilize Ukraine politically and economically speaking. This is at least as important as dealing with the question of how Russia can be prevented from taking next military steps and aggressions in Ukraine. And this is not a long-term task. It is also long-term, but it is also required short-term, especially when it comes to the Ukrainian economy. We need instant and immediate massive financial aids and funding programs in order to stabilize the situation of the country. Then more energy independence. That is not really a new proposal, but one that definitely needs to be put into this context. So the energy turnaround in Europe needs to be accelerated to reduce the dependency from Russian oil and gas. And I could add other aspects, but this is a whole list of responses to the question of what can we do. It is not a fatalistic situation where you just watch the disaster without doing anything. No, it is a challenge. 
we are challenged to become active politically. And this presupposes a respective willingness to act. And I hope that this is something that you will take home from this debate here today. We will break for 30 minutes now and we'll come back to the auditorium for a second panel, which will delve into the details regarding the perspectives in and for Ukraine. Thank you very much.